falling so downstream, and then you have it. Italiano, working here at the IAS, we're going to talk to us about the studies in yeah. Korean different money. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming. And uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, transition. We, we heard a lot about uh, QP observations yesterday and this morning, some great talks. Uh, so I'll now try to uh, discuss a model that we've been working on to explain QPs. But actually, some aspects of it were already mentioned in a few of the discussions yesterday, but um, I'll give an overview of the main features and the predictions that we make. And, um, how we think some of the properties of QPs may be explained. So I went over the, uh, the observations. We heard quite a lot about it. I'll just mention perhaps a couple of important features that uh, I will try to address in our model. Um, so one has to do with uh, the spectral evolution of the QP flares. So we heard this by Ricardo and also now by Giovanni, how uh, QPs, well, um, the flares seem to rise earlier in the harder bands, also decay faster, and also have this typical hysteresis loop. Um, this is one feature that, as we heard, uh, every QPE model should be able to explain. Um, another interesting feature is this short, long uh, recurrence time behavior that we just heard about, right? So just to, to um, say this explicitly, at least in some of the systems, um, we see this behavior where flares come in uh, two recurrence times, short and long, alternating between the two. So this is in GSN 69. This is for um, one epoch of the Euro QPE2. And you can also see this from a paper by Ricardo showing uh, when you fold the light curve of pairs or triplets of, of uh, flares. So you see that for the uh, Ones with the regular behavior, you see that uh, yeah, there's actually one uh, total period, which is the sum of the short and the long period, uh, while some of the other systems show this more erratic behavior where flares essentially come in a wide range of uh, timing or phases with respect to the total average period. So this is going to be an important feature in, in the model I'll describe. Um, and then we had uh, a lot of discussion about this possible association between QPs and TDs. And we also just uh, heard about it in the context of uh, GSN 69. So I guess this is another thing that, uh, you know, we should be able to explain or at least uh, suggest an association between the appearance of QPs after what seems to be like a long gradual uh, decay of X-rays, which may or may not be directly related to uh, bona fide TD. Um, so here is, you know, perhaps a long checklist. Uh, I think it mostly overlaps with what uh, Giovanni has just mentioned regarding features that a QPE model should be able to satisfy. Um, I think that, you know, what I'll be describing will be able to answer most of this, but uh, there are definitely several features that are still uh, open questions. And I think uh, I hope that the discussions that we'll have uh, this afternoon will also be helpful in understanding uh, some of the theoretical constraints on those. Okay, so um, I'll proceed to describe uh, a theoretical model. Um, there have been in the last couple of years, you know, a dozen of models, uh, more models than uh, QPE systems, that's for sure, uh, trying to, to explain these systems. Um, they come in different flavors, but what I'll describe now is sort of uh, a different flavor. And I guess that the main idea is sort of summed in this uh, cartoon. So this is a project that uh, Brian and I have been working on. And uh, this appears in this paper that uh, is in late stages of uh, uh, referral. So the main idea is uh, you have a star and an accretion disk. So the star is what we call a stellar emery. So it is orbiting the supermassive black hole on a fairly tight orbit. Um, so the star punches through the disk twice per orbit. What causes the actual flares are the collisions of the star with the disk. So in each such collision, some of the disk material gets uh, ejected. You have this ejecting cloud of heated, shock heated material that expands and cools and produces the X-ray flares. 
uh, what causes the what leads to the uh, quiescent emission is the disk itself. So that's what you see in between the flares. So the timing of the flares will be subject to the precession that the orbit undergoes, both nodal and upsidal precession, possibly also the more complicated um, precession of the disk if it exists. Um, and I'll also discuss this idea of the TD and QP association. Okay, so uh, let's start uh, addressing the, the features that this model uh, might be able to explain. So by construction, we set the uh, orbital period of the star to be the sum of the short and long recurrence time that we're seeing. So the total QPE period, uh, which is twice the average period. So you know, we simply set it to be you know, the range of five to say 18 hours or even longer depending on the system. Uh, and the deviations between the short and long will generally depend on the orientation of the orbit with respect to the disk. But for a general configuration, if the inclination is not too low, then roughly the, the difference or, or the difference, the relative difference between the long and short uh, times will be uh, off the order of the eccentricity. So as we just heard, the difference between the long and short at least in some of these systems is of order of a few percent, maybe 10%. So that implies eccentricity of roughly 0.1. And later in the talk, when I'll get to discuss the dynamical formation of such a system, I'll actually point out that this eccentricity is actually quite typical. You have to be a bit more uh, careful because if you also consider light travel time, then the deviations and the time it takes uh, the light from the flares, depending on the position, will also depend on the orientation. And these deviations are also introduce a few percent difference. So, you know, if you want to do this a bit more carefully, then you have to be um, yeah, accounting for that. Okay, so let's take a closer look at what actually happens at the collisions themselves. So here I'm showing this cartoon of uh, you know, the slab of a disk and the star plunging through it. So you can estimate the energetics and some of the properties of the ejecta that will be resulting from such a collision. So the mass intercepted by the star will essentially be dictated by the amount of mass in the cylinder that the star punches through the disk. So this will depend on the size of the star and the surface density of the disk, which will depend on its m dot or you know, the uh, disk alpha parameter. So we assumed you know, some fiducial values, Eddington ratios of you know, a few percent, um, and typical alpha values. The velocity of the star is essentially the Keplerian velocity. So that is also uh, the velocity of the shock that the star drives through the disk material. And that gives you the scale of the amount of initial energy in this shock heated ejecta, uh, which is something like 10 to the 46 Hertz. I should also mention that um, for a star, you don't gain um, much more radius. I mean, the effective cross section is essentially the geometrical cross section of the star because gravitational focusing is negligible in this regime. Um, this is unlike the case of, uh, say, a compact object plunging through the disk, where then the effective radius is something like the Bondi Hoyle radius. Well, I'll get to that point later on. Okay, so initially, this ejector that we just uh, shock heated is very uh, optically thick, so it doesn't radiate. Um, so we will need to account for that. Uh, but another interesting feature is it turns out that actually uh, you, contrary to might, you might uh, expect, this ejecta actually expands in both directions, both above and below the midplane of the disk um, in roughly symmetrical fashion. Uh, this is seen in some uh, fairly old simulations of uh, an emery passing through through the secretion disk and also more recent simulations that also some of the people in the room have been looking into. This is also seen. Uh, and one way to think of it is that uh, as the star plunges through the disk, it heats this uh, disk material, which then uh, needs to expand because of the pressure gradient. So basically it finds a path of least resistance. So some material is directly coupled to the star and will push forward, but some of the material will find its way going in the opposite direction. And as perhaps a more uh, terrestrial example, I'm sure you've all seen this picture of uh, you know, an apple being punctured by a bullet shot into it. Um, you can see that 
you know, in this example, right, uh, there's this, uh, some material is thrown ahead and some material is thrown in the other direction. And yeah, the bullet is going in that direction. Okay, so going back to the radiation that is associated with this expanding ejecta. So initially the optical depth is very high because the optical depth of the disc is very high. So most of the radiation will escape once the optical depth of this cloud of ejecta goes to something like uh, C over the expansion velocity. So to optical depth of roughly 10. And uh, if you assume that this uh, cloud of ejecta expands um, ballistically, then that gives you the time at which that occurs. Uh, then you can account for the energy, the adiabatic losses to the internal energy of this uh, ejecta. And that gives you a uh, scale of the luminosity associated with the you know, initial burst of photons that will be uh, associated with this expanding ejecta. So the time scale over which um, this emission takes place is a fraction of an hour. That's you know the typical time scale of the rise and the decay as well. So this is roughly consistent with what we see for uh, QPEs. The luminosity is also in the right ballpark, roughly 10 to the 41, 10 to the 42 Earths per second, depending on the exact parameters. That also sets uh, the radius of this expanding cloud at the time of peak. Now, if you were to take these values and then estimate the associated temperature of the emission, you would get something that is too low. So if you assume a black body radiation and given this radius and luminosity, the optical depth, that gives you something like 10 electron volts. Well, we know that the flares are actually in the range of 100 to 200 electron volts. And one thing that comes in our help is the fact that uh, actually uh, this assumption of being in thermal equilibrium or black body radiation is not justified in this case. And the reason is that as the star passes through the disk and shock heats this disk material, there isn't enough time to produce enough photons in the ejecta uh, during the time the star passes through the disk. So if you account for the photon production rate through Bremsstrahlung and also include Compton scattering in this process, it turns out that um, with respect to the number of photons that you actually need to sustain uh, thermal equilibrium or black body radiation, uh, you don't have enough photons. So it means that a smaller number of photons share the same, uh, the total energy density, which means that the average energy per photon is boosted. So this, you know, for the fiducial values that we uh, considered, that boosts the observed temperature from say 10 electron volts to roughly 100 electron volts, so in the X-rays. So this is a crucial part of the model. And you know, if you don't account for that, then the emission is simply too soft. Uh, I should also mention that this symmetric or the, the fact that you uh, emit ejecta in both directions is also crucial because you know if you were to observe the system from one side of the disk and this ejecta would only come in the direction along with the direction of the star then you would only see one flare per orbit rather than two and then you would not get this long short alternating behavior so here we show a couple of um, a couple of uh, figures showing um, different properties of our model also with respect to the observation. So we're showing here uh, Eero QP2 and GSN 069. We mainly consider these two sources because they had this clear behavior of this long short alternating behavior. So they seem like good candidates for this model. Um, so you see that, you know, depending on the values that you assume, uh, the model predicts um, values that are consistent with the observations, give or take. Uh, so this is the, the flare luminosity, the observed temperature, the duration of the flare, and what you might think of as the uh, observability. So this is also related to the last talk we heard, uh, the ratio between the temperature of the flare and the temperature of the disk, which seems to be a crucial parameter in understanding when our QP is actually observable. So another thing feature that you get for free from this model is exactly this behavior of uh, fast rise and the harder bands and 
faster decay. So you can think of this expanding ejecta simply like as a, the shock phase of a supernova. So if you look at you know, this is comparison from type 1A um, uh, explosions, they also show this exact behavior where the harder bands uh, come to peak faster and also decay faster. So this is a feature that you get from this uh, model. Can you, yeah. can you explain that behavior? Yeah, so essentially, if you think of this expanding ejecta, right? So um, as I said, the emission is dominated by the time that the optical depth approaches C over V. But then as it continues to expand, uh, inner and inner regions of the ejecta uh, dominate the emission. So this will depend on the velocity profile and the density profile of the ejecta, but you can always associate um, the luminosity shell or the region from which uh, the emission is currently dominated. So you're going to see deeper and deeper into the ejecta from slower and slower moving material. And you know this eventually produces this behavior where um, the um, yeah, the slower material that is emitting also is also cooler um, comes to peak at a later time. So that is you know, a standard feature of this very basic uh, model of an expanding cloud of ejecta. And what about the decaying part? So the time scale will, of the rise and the decay is essentially similar in, in this case. So you know, if you come to peak um, on a longer time scale, then you also decay more gradually, uh, simply set by the time. Well, the, this emitting layer is the one at which the dynamical time is currently similar to the photon diffusion time. So if the photon diffusion time is longer than all of these time scales will be longer, the rise and the decay. OK, so. Um, one aspect of, of this model that we propose is, is this idea that uh, Emery plus TDE equals QP. So, so far I haven't addressed the, the origin of the disk, but one thing one might imagine is the scenario where you have an Emery already orbiting the supermassive black hole. To consider the gravitational wave time scale of such an Emery, uh, it will stay there for about a million years. So, in this galaxy in which this supermassive black hole resides, there will be plenty of TDEs during this time scale. So an independent star every 10 to the four years, roughly, will undergo a TDE and form a compact disk with which the Emery that was already there can now interact. So that's how you essentially trigger the QPEs. So I'll go into a few features of this model, uh, but first I'll perhaps uh, explain the, the dynamical way in which these uh, components, the Emery, the TDE, uh, occur. So one sort of useful way to think of processes that happen in galactic nuclei is this schematic uh, phase space that shows possible orbits of stars around the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. So the y-axis here is the very center distance, which is closely related to the angular momentum of the orbit. The x axis is the semi major axis. So, this is like the uh, inverse orbital energy. Uh, so, this diagonal line corresponds to circular orbits, and there are no orbits around here because the Terry center distance is always smaller than the semi major axis. So, most stars within the galactic nucleus um, reside at around the radius of influence, so on a parsec scale. So that's where most stars are located. And if you think about processes that lead to the uh, evolution of orbits, then the dominant one would be two-body scattering or other relaxational processes, which for slightly eccentric orbits, if you're moving away from this line, the relaxation time in angular momentum is typically shorter than the relaxation time in energy. So that implies that if you slightly deviate from this line, then relaxation in angular momentum causes uh, diffusion up and down along this line until you're occasionally your um, uh, angular momentum becomes low enough such that you get to the tidal radius and that's how you form a TD. That's a toy model picture of how TDs are formed. If you start out with a smaller semi-major axis, a different trajectory can occur. 
uh, where initially you also diffuse up and down along this line because of relaxation due to two body scatterings. But then once you get below this green line, that's the region in phase space where gravitational wave uh, emission is the dominant process that leads to the evolution of the orbit. And then gravitational waves take over. So you essentially decouple from the rest of the background stars. You start to circularize and approach the supermassive black hole on a fairly tight orbit. So that might be the way in which you form these stellar emeries. Okay, so stars that are located on fairly circular orbits, very close to the supermassive black hole. Um, in principle, what actually dominates the rate at which stars are being fed into this orbit is the probably the Hills mechanism. So among the stars located here, you also have binaries. So if a binary star gets close enough to the black hole due to a similar process, one star will be ejected as a hypervelocity star. The other star will remain bound on a very eccentric orbit with an eccentricity of 0.99. So depending on the initial binary separation, the remaining component of this binary will be injected somewhere along this red line. And then it will undergo a similar evolution. So it will diffuse up and down if it's in this part of phase space or will directly be swept away with the gravitational waves if it's in this part of the phase space. But essentially this process injects stars that can end up on the relevant orbits. Okay, so that's how you produce the emery. Um, and these guys, these TDs form the disks with which uh, the stellar emeries can now interact. A nice feature of this very simplified uh, model is that you can also uh, estimate the eccentricity distribution of stars when they get to a certain uh, size of period, let's say you know, the periods uh, consistent with QPs. And you can actually derive this analytically if you assume something for the density profile of stars. It seems like eccentricity of 0.1, which I mentioned earlier in the talk, it seems to be uh, the typical eccentricity of emeries when they get to these small orbits. So the TDE rate is essentially dictated by the rate at which stars are scattered from around here. So this is simply set by the two body scattering rate. So that gives you this famous one TDE per 10 to the four years. Um, the Hills mechanism will produce something at a similar rate, which will depend on the fraction of binaries. So maybe 10 to the one such emery per 10 to the five years, maybe 10 to the six. But if you combine this with the fact that they spend about a million years around the orbit, uh, if nothing else happens, then you would expect to have you know, between 0.1 to maybe 10 such in spirals in every galaxy, at least within this simplified picture. So the question of how many MREs do actually produce uh, QPs, or you know, how many, you can ask this the other way around, how many TDEs are followed by QPs uh, depends on the question of how many stellar emeries are there in a given moment. And that will depend on the question of how many emeries can survive multiple TDs. So a couple more features of this idea that the disk comes from a TDE. So it's likely that the, the disk that the TDE forms will have an extent that is maybe twice the tidal radius. So that naturally produces this feature that we are seeing that QPs happen with periods that are similar to the orbital period around the tidal radius, which is by definition similar to the dynamical time of the stars. If you want to understand why are we seeing QPs with time scales of say hours to a day, then this is you know, a direct feature of this picture. So the disk will evolve with time. You know, there will be the, the fallback rate of the disk. So that will determine the properties of the disk. So you will have some time evolution over the evolution of the disk. Um, another aspect that we considered is the fact that the star, aside from producing these flares, is also ablated by the disk. So the collisions between the star and the disk can also strip away some of the stellar material. And that actually might limit the amount of um, passages of the star through the disk uh, that the star can survive before it is fully uh, ablated or, or disrupted. Um, 
So that is actually one of the reasons why we propose the TDE as the origin of the risk rather than a more extended, long-lived AGN, simply because then the emeries that are you know, subject to produce these QPEs on short orbits will simply be completely ablated by the AGN disk when they were still on much wider orbits. So you know, this is speculation. Maybe they do survive. Maybe their core survives. But you know, this is one uh, aspect of this model that we propose. Um, OK, I, I think I will go over this very briefly. But um, you can ask, okay, why does it have to be a star? Why can't it be a compact object? So I alluded to this earlier, but the effective cross-section in the case of a compact object will be set by, say, the Bondi oil, which will typically be much smaller than the radius of the star, which means that this object will then couple to a much smaller amount of um, disk material and will produce much fainter flares. So if you want to have a compact object that is capable of producing what a star produces, it needs to be quite massive, a mass of more than 10 to the three solar mass, so an IMBH. Um, the problem with this interpretation that QPs originate from IMBHs is that then the supermassive black hole will uh, grow significantly by uh, accretion of, or by merging with these IMBHs. Uh, so we have this observational constraint that we know that QPs happen mm -hmm. from observations roughly in one to, um, 10 to the five galaxies. So then you can estimate what is the growth rate uh, because of uh, merging with IMBHs. And it turns out that the supermassive black holes will be dominated by IMBH, um, uh, merging with IMBHs. So this is, um, in, this favors this interpretation. Um, oh, sorry, this was on the slide. Okay, so you can do more complicated analysis of uh, the timing of the flares and also account for the different upsidal uh, precession and nodal precession uh, processes that take place both the disk and the orbit. And I think uh, Alicia will talk about this in her talk. This might be an interesting way to perhaps constrain uh, the SMBH uh, spin. So I'll also mention briefly um, what we've just heard from Giovanni about the disappearance and reappearance of QPs. So just to remind you, right, we had this TDE-like decay of the X-ray flux over several years. Um, no QPs were observed, say, in 2014. Then they appeared in 2019. And then there was this rebrightening. They disappeared again. And now we see them again with now a different so this is, I think, a very interesting uh, observation, and I think it will teach us a lot. Um, so there is this interesting question, is the sum of the um, long and short recurrence time, is it similar or not to what we had before? Uh, if it is, then it would say that the orbit may have changed its eccentricity or its orientation, but there was no significant dissipation of orbital energy uh, in whatever happened during this flare. So this is one possibility. Otherwise, maybe the orbit has changed considerably. And this would imply that something dramatic happened during this rise phase of the quiescence. Um, another idea that we have regarding this rise of the quiescence, in addition to what Giovanni mentioned, which is a partial TDE occurring uh, back in 2010 and again uh, nine years later, is that possibly the star which produces the QPs um, has undergone this runaway ablation by the interaction with the star, with the disk, uh, which led to an excess of mass being fed through the star itself, which then produced this flare. These, the star obviously survived because we still see these QPs. So maybe it was stripped out of its outer layers and a core remained. And what we're seeing now is the interaction of the remaining core with the disk. Um, it could also be that the star was brought into Rochdale overflow uh, as it was gradually being, uh, its orbit was gradually degraded and um, got to the point that mass was stripped from the star, not only by ablation, but also by tidal stripping. 
So these are some thoughts we have regarding this particular system. Um, one more thing I will mention is this observation that Ricardo showed us yesterday, where for Eero QP2, we've been seeing this long short alternating behavior, but then two years later, we've, we're now seeing a single period, which is uh, shorter than the previous recurrence times we've been seeing both the long and the short. So that gives a certain uh, constraint on the P dot or the orbital evolution of the energy in this case. And if you consider this uh, that disk induced the drag picture uh, that we propose, then you can actually explain this P dot quite easily with you know, reasonable fiducial values of our model. So I think this is sort of another interesting point and more observations will tell us whether this P dot we're seeing is actually uh, continuing to, to occur in this system. Um, I'll briefly mention other periodic nuclear transient. So uh, we have, uh, okay, uh, this is the, the last slide. Um, so I think we'll be hearing from uh, Anna Payne, who uh, was here yesterday, but I'm not seeing her now, about uh, assassin 14 ko So this is another repeating nuclear transient with a periodicity of 115 days, which also has a P dot, which uh, in a project uh, I've been working on with Elliot, we've been uh, showing that this P dot in this system could also be explained by interaction of a star with uh, this, with an accretion disk. So here's the checklist. Um, I think some features are easily explained by this model. Some are perhaps more difficult to explain. So I think this irregular systems, um, it requires a bit more complicated modeling and accounting for these different precession effects. This question of preference to low mass SMBHs, I think is still very much open. And also, you know, the presence of QPOs, I think is something that we still need to be thinking about. Um, yeah, and I think I'll finish here. Um, for the idea that for GSN 069, um, there's a evolution in the or in the QPE, and you're not, or the I guess the second round QPE could be due to a partial TDE rose level flow runaway ablation. For runaway ablation, I was thinking if you're saying that you're stripping the envelope, you're significantly changing the cross section of the star. Is that something that would be that you could kind of just estimate the change in your model from your model, like what the difference in the flare would look like because you're just potentially disrupting so much less mass from the disk. Yeah, so, so honestly, we don't really know what happened, right? This is- Sure, sure, sure. That's why I'm saying if it yeah. was that, maybe that'd be an observable. Yeah. So, okay, so I'll just perhaps, uh, since you've asked about this. So the idea behind this runaway ablation is the fact that if you take a star and you strip a small amount of mass from it and you do it fast enough on a time scale that is shorter than its cooling time, if it's a low mass star, then it will slightly expand because of that. So now its cross section will increase, which would mean that the, the next passage will only strip more, more mass from it. So, you know, in, in this way, you, you get this runaway behavior. Now, it's true that, you know, if a huge amount of mass was stripped from it, and now the remaining star is much smaller, uh, then, yeah, you would anticipate that the following passages of the star through the disk would produce flares with a different luminosity and behavior. But honestly, I think, um, Right. So Giovanni just mentioned uh, that the amount of accreted mass in this phase is like uh, 0.05 or like a few percent of the solar mass. So, you know, I wouldn't be Not too concerned about the star now being much smaller than it was before, but it, it is a good point. Yeah, so you're saying it's smaller than the fraction you find in the envelope, so it wouldn't probably have talked about them. So I, it's very interesting to think about it. What phase in a TDE could you, would you see a QPE? So this idea, I mean, you kind of starting with this nice clean disc and then you're uh, having a star uh, colliding with it. So from what we're observing from TDEs, um, especially the number of them that are optically bright, they have a much messier structure on larger scales than just a bare disk. They can eventually look like a bare disk, um, but 
you know, initial times there, you know, you, you think that they're more extended structure due to the stream stream collisions and um, maybe outflows and other uh, phenomena. So I'm curious if you're only going to see the impact of this emery in this very, very clean system of the settled bare disk. And if that sets a condition of sort of, you know, what kind of TDEs should we be looking at um, to find this phenomenon? Yeah, this is a good point. And I think we don't fully understand yet from the theoretical point of view, what point will TDE settle onto this mean this that this model sort of uh, requires and evokes. In principle, yeah, I mean, as the TD evolves and you perhaps evolve from this more messy configuration where gas is not necessarily in a, you know, confined, clean disk uh, structure, then yeah, it would still get some sort of interaction between uh, the star and the, you know, the pre-existing Emory and whatever flow there is. Um, I think it's probably going to be a bit more complicated to uh, estimate what would be the observable signature, if any, of that. Um, I think it's reasonable to, to assume that, at least, you know, since right, it seems like if you assume a thin disk, then this is able to produce a lot of the features we're seeing. So, you know, there's a question of as the disk evolves and perhaps becomes from, you know, more puffy or like different phases of accretion to this uh, radiatively efficient phase. You, know, you could you could imagine that also the QPEs perhaps undergo like different phases of evolution where initially they're unobservable and then they're observable once you get to that. So I guess you know going back to um, the question about what sort of PDEs should we be looking at. So you know the from the theoretical point of view, we have the, those that will eventually uh, lead to this bare disk configuration. I think are most promising. Uh, but I think there's a lot of uncertainties regarding when does this happen? And what sort of systems does it happen? Um, yeah, so I don't have. I mean, maybe I can just add one thing, which is that in this model, the luminosity of the flare is sublinear in the in the accretion rate, whereas the quiescent uh, luminosity is nominally linear <laughs> in the accretion rate. Just to get to Giovanni's point about why, as you go up in accretion rate, why the disk should outshine the flares, that is a prediction of this scenario. So. Yeah. So it isn't surprising that we're not, you know, even if it was a organized thin disk at these early times, it's not surprising that the disk is outshining it uh, in the, in the context of this scenario. But right. So I mean, this is another prediction to make that you're, you're not necessarily expecting to see these QPEs from from the start. Right. The disk should settle to you know that the M dot should decrease to a certain level. Um, it should be in this regular configuration. Um, so, you know, also you could imagine that the, the Emory itself is perhaps on an orbit that is several times the tidal radius. So only once the disk expands to intercept the Emory, only then you would start seeing these two beams. So possibly in many cases, you, you just have this Emory that is on a slightly wider orbit and nothing happens because the disk never, you know, really interacts with it. Uh, I, I'm try, trying to understand your picture of shock yes. emerging from this. Uh, in the, I mean, the similarity of shock breakout theory of supernovae. And uh, in the case of supernovae, uh, when shock emerges, uh, I mean, as you explained to uh, Ricardo's yeah. question, very early time scale, you see it's just a very tiny sun outermost part of the ejector and uh, its emission should be very hot. So I'm wondering, is it possible to detect I mean, more high energy emission at early time scale? Yeah, this is a good question. I think it will ultimately depend on the density profile of <coughs> material in the disk and the exact nature of this collision of the star with the disk. You know, to be honest, we assumed a very simplified yeah. analytical yes. model here. So we didn't, you know, if you really want to answer these questions, then you need to do um, hydrodynamics yes. simulations with radiation and really account for the probably not so trivial geometry of what happens as the star plows through the disk. 
I don't remember uh, some, is there any already constraint from high energy, I mean, hardware X-ray observation? Uh, for the source sources? Yeah. There isn't much about 2 kb. Yeah, uh, the possibly. I mean, there might be this flare, but possibly its time scale will be very short. So it'll be something akin to the supernova shock breakout. So you know, the first emergence of the shock driven by the star from the edge of the disk. But um, I mean, my guess is that the time scale will be very short, and the amount of energy associated with that initial flare will be quite small. And you know what we think that actually produces the flare is something that is more similar to uh, you know the shock cooling phase where this heated material now expands and radiates. Um, Disks are also much less stratified in density, so there's a lot less acceleration as you get to the quote surface of the disk than when you get to the surface of the star. That's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. In the in the supernova case. An important feature of that is the fact that the, the shock can actually accelerate to several times its velocity in the inner parts of the stars. So that what actually couples you know, this high amount of relatively high amount of energy to a small mass produces this bright flare. Hi. Yes. Uh, if, if if you can keep these slides on, uh, I, I I just noticed that the the problem let's say uh, the seeming the, the the problem that appears to be with the with the temperature of the emission that you need to invoke then something else to upscatter that uh, is related actually to the size of the emitting region that you you get uh, let's say too high with respect to the observations which doesn't mean that the observations are right because it, the, there are models <laughs> under, uh, uh, behind what we derived uh, as a 10 to the 11 let's say centimeters but of course, if you add uh, an emitting radius of uh, 10 to the 11, you would automatically get uh, uh, the right uh, temperature. And I just noticed that there, the, the peak uh, uh, radius is set by the Keplerian velocity, basically, of the star, uh, which is uh, probably uh, the velocity of the shock only uh, in a given uh, geometrical configuration. It would it should perhaps be more uh, the relative velocity between the gas in the disk and the star uh, uh, that plays a role there. Uh, can you can you yes. uh, say something about it? Would it be, would it be possible to to get the right uh, um, radius, the right temperature yeah. without invoking upscattering just by considering a different uh, geometrical configuration? Um, okay, so I think I think that it's going to be challenging to get a velocity that is very different from the Keplerian velocity, unless you're in some specific configuration where, you know, the orbital relative orbital inclination is quite low, and then the star and the, the gas are sort of, you know, moving at similar velocities, but this will be a transient phase. And in general, you know, with some evolution of the inclination, then I think that it would be in a phase where, yeah, the relative velocity will be more similar to the Keplerian velocity. Um, going, going back to your point, or perhaps commenting on that, I think this is exactly right. As you mentioned, if you assume a black body emission for the observations, then you get a radius that is quite small. Um, and this is exactly reconciled by the fact that actually the uh, observed temperature is, is not in, well, the, the emission is not in thermal equilibrium. So what you, you see as the uh, black body radius is actually quite smaller than the actual radius of this uh, cloud of ejecta. So that's you know, this point that I was making in this slide. Um, you know, there could be, I mean, people have also looked into other configurations. There was also this recent paper by Hiromichi Tagawa who looked into um, breakout of the bow shock of the star as it goes through an AGN disk. So, you know, possibly uh, different configurations could give you the right uh, emission properties. But um, my feeling is that if you want to uh, satisfy this uh, long short alternating behavior and, um, you know, other constraints and the fact that a priori there shouldn't be, um, you know, the, the orbit of the disk and the orbit of the star should not be aligned, then this is probably the geometry that um, 
you might want to consider. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Uh, so, sorry, just just one comment, and then just to bring a little bit observation and theory together. Uh, would you would you predict then uh, that uh, your model is bound? to have QPEs uh, in the UV, optical, and infrared uh, since uh, this uh, under DV that we see in the X-ray is just by upscattering. So there will be, a, I mean, a distribution uh, towards the, the lower energies that we don't see perhaps because we are contaminated, but we might be able to select the right source to look at uh, uh, QPEs at other wavelengths, which might be a way of uh, uh, really deriving what the emission mechanism is. Yeah, so this is a good question, and uh, the short answer is that we we are still looking into that. So uh, I think this requires a somewhat more detailed analysis of uh, the these photon production mechanisms in the ejecta. So this is something that we're um, yeah looking into, and uh, this will be very interesting to know what is the observability of QPEs in say the UV. And uh, what is the you know the relative SED of the QPE flares compared to the um, to the disk emission? And uh, yeah, can, can, I, can I just follow up on one thing, which is the fact that we're we're saying it's not black body emission doesn't mean it doesn't have something that's almost black body in shape. Right. So if you have sure, a sure, yes. starved ejecta, it's a beam spectrum. You still have the beam cut off, etc. But it's but you know, below that, whether we get uh, something akin to, to, to optically thin free free or whether we get this Comptonized rise. So yes, anyways, I just wanted to clarify that. Right, I think that the fact that we are, I mean, the observations show us, uh, we see this sort of exponential cutoff that is consistent with black body. Um, but as Brian said, you know, in our model, it will be something more akin to uh, yeah, free free emission, which also yes, has yes, yeah. cutoff. So I think uh, at this point, I think that, both pictures are, are uh, consistent. So, sure. Uh, so, can we keep modeling QPs approximately even with a black body? Because we would like now to bring all the observations together and try to find whether these qualitative mysteries that we see in energy evolution is also leading to an universal type of either expansion or temperature evolution, assuming this black body model. So as soon as we will have a more informed idea of what the spectrum should actually look like, then you know we'll be happy to share that with you, and uh, you know you could then use so different, different yeah model. different templates to to fit for the observations. Um, since what we are seeing is mostly the this right the wind tail yeah. of, of the of the spectrum, then I think it's pretty, it's, it's pretty safe for the time being. But you know, we should bear in mind that maybe it's. Going to deviate from I think the point is if you infer a radius, uh, don't maybe don't take it too literally because it may be off systematically. Mm -hmm. and, and well, that's, that was my other question. Yeah. Is it like a systematic offset? So well, can we can we try to look for given trends like in terms of expansion or constant area, regardless of the number of this? Yeah, so we we'll have to go for yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Three plots uh, we don't want to. Do that. Uh, oh. No, I think we have to go. Yeah, yeah, that's no, fine. <laughs> but you can ask during COVID. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.